This is Nilanjana Sengupta, um, a faculty oh, sorry. member. Yes. Oh, I can't hear you. Um... Can you hear me Hello? now? Can people hear me? Uh, I can't hear you. Can the organizers we, hear me? We can, we can hear him. We can hear that you're not. Am I audible to the organizers? Yes, ma'am. You are uh, audible. Okay. Uh, is Professor Oppenheim audible to you? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, I can't hear anybody at the okay. moment. Um... Uh -huh. Front, right, front, left. Uh, is it working now? My speaker seems to be on, but I don't have any sound coming from the Zoom. Um, is somebody speaking now? Yes, Jonathan. Um, you know, I can hear you. Hello? Yeah, just. Okay, the problem is I can't hear anybody else. Uh -huh. um, I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, but I'm not sure. I can't hear anybody. Um, um, would you? Sound is on. Try that, okay. I'll try logging back on and in. Mm -hmm. Ah, oh, there we go. Can everyone hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, oh, we can hear you. Okay, sorry about all that. Uh, are we audible now? Yes, indeed. Okay, fantastic. So, organizers, should we begin? Yes, ma'am. You okay. can start. Now. Give me just one moment. I will. I will just give me just one moment. Okay, find it. Okay, 
So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Neelanjana. Uh, I'm a faculty member. Um, I do biophysics at ISA Kolkata. And I'm presently in Munich, incidentally. But nonetheless, it is a pleasure and a privilege to be uh, asked to chair this session, this plenary talk by Professor Jonathan Oppenheim. Uh, professor Oppenheim is a professor of quantum theory and uh, at the Royal Society University oh. and the Royal Society University Research Fellow in the Department of Physics and Astronomy within the Quantum Information Group at the UC London uh, University College London. His research interests are in the uh, areas of quantum information th theory, quantum gravity and black holes, quantum thermodynamics, and the foundations of quantum mechanics. And the title of his talk today would be Gravitationally Induced Decoherence versus Space-Time Diffusion, Testing the Quantum Nature of Gravity. So Professor Oppenheim, it's a big, it's a great pleasure to invite you to deliver this plenary talk. And I would like to hand over the platform to you. Great, thanks very much. And thanks for the invitation. I'm gonna now attempt to share my screen and see what happens. Um, that should work. Okay. And now. Can everyone see my yes, first slide? Great. And are we, is this being recorded or? Uh, organizers, are you planning to record the talks? Uh, talk will be uh, live streamed on the YouTube, so that is not the problem. Okay, so there's a direct. Okay. There's a no another set of audience uh, watching it from YouTube, I think. Okay. Okay. I'm happy to take questions during the um, talk if anyone uh, wants to ask. So just okay. um, go ahead, and um, uh, especially because this is a a talk which is at the interface of quantum information theory and gravity, and no one really is an expert in both uh, fully. So uh, please do uh, ask questions at any point. Um, and I'll try and stick to 45 minutes, I think, is that, is that right? That's fair enough, questions. yeah. I will request the audience to kind of raise their hands so that, you know, I might uh, intervene on their behalf. And beyond that, I guess, you know, people can ask questions at the end of the talk as well. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to start with a very, um, so let me just say that this joint work with um, some of my students, um, Isaac Layton, Carlos Barakahari, Barbara Skoda, and Zach Weller-Davies, and there are a few um, preprints on the archive. Um, the uh, first question I'm going to ask is very basic and fundamental, I think. Um, you know, we have many uh, laws of physics and many forces, but they all fit into two frameworks, or even actually maybe only one framework. Um, one is quantum mechanics, um, and one is classical mechanics. And the, um, the form of both of these uh, th uh, frameworks, let's call them, um, is very similar. So in quantum mechanics, you have a, um, a density matrix representing the quantum state, and it involves according to the Heisenberg equation. And in classical mechanics, we have a probability density in phase space, and it evolves according to the Louisville equation here. Um, and so the question I'm going to ask is just fairly basic is, can we have a quantum system which interacts with a classical system? Um, so here we have phase space and a points in phase space in the classical system, and the Hilbert space, a qubit. And we want to know, can these two things interact? Um, now, they uh, we, we we do this all the time. For example, if we have a particle in a potential, then we treat the potential usually classically, um, and the classical potential acts on the quantum particle. Likewise, in a double slit experiment, the slits and the, the screen are treated classically, um, and the um, particle is quantum. Um, but what I'm interested in here is the, the back reaction problem. Can we have a quantum system which back reacts and um, exerts a force on a classical system. Um, and there's been a huge debate back and forth um, over the years. Um, and there's more recent papers, which I, I should update this, uh, but there's been quite a, a big debate on the issue. Um, I think um, dating most forcefully to Feynman and Aronov, and I will go over their um, arguments. Um, um, but there's been this whole history. Um, 
so for example, um, in gravity, people use something called the semi-classical Einstein equation based on expect expectation values. It's known to be pathological when quantum fluctuations are large. Um, in quantum chemistry, there's various um, equations which go by the, the name of quantum classical hybrid dynamics. These have negative probabilities, but usually people you know, don't necessarily mind if they're working in a regime where, where, um, where they don't get these negative probabilities. Um, um, and there um, are even e uh, experiments which have been proposed, um, and I should update this uh, as well, but there have been experiments which have been proposed to, for example, test whether gravity, which is the one force we have which is has not been quantized, whether gravity could, in fact, be classical or quantum. Um, so there's all this history, um, and it even includes a few simple examples of um, models where um, you know, one system is treated classically and another system is treated quantumly. Um, so this is essentially the history um, of this field of classical quantum dynamics. Um, I'm motivated um, by a few, a few reasons. One is that I think gravity is special. I'm not going to get into the arguments now about why gravity is different from all other forces, but gravity alone is can be represented universally as the curvature of a, a space-time background, whereas all the other forces are fields living in that background. So I think gravity is somehow special, and it, it may be that we shouldn't be quantizing gravity. And given that we've failed to, quant to quantize gravity for the last 100 years, I think it's worth revisiting that question about whether gravity really is a quantum force. Um, I'm also interested in these hybrid classical quantum theories um, as either an effective theory. For example, um, we often are interested in gravity in the limit where we treat space-time as classical. I'm interested in it because I'm interested in uh, uh, information destruction by black holes, whether that's fundamental or effective. And I'm also interested in understanding if you know maybe gravity is really a quantum force but we can understand it by looking at these classical quantum theories which are often more tractable and easier to understand than a quantum theory of gravity itself um so the results i will and i will only present a little bit of it um are as follows we're able to derive the most general form of classical quantum dynamics we find there are two kinds of classical quantum dynamics one which is continuous in phase space and one which has finite size jumps. Um, we're able to formulate a theory of classical general relativity um, interacting with quantum field theory. Um, and we, there's a few kind of bonuses we get along the way. For example, we find that the Born rule and the measurement postulate are not needed um, at all because the classical nature of space time would, in some sense, cause quantum fields to become classical or to have classical properties. And finally, and this is mostly what I'm going to be talking about, um, we find that there's this trade-off in any theory in which one system is treated quantumly and one system classically, and we call this the decoherence versus diffusion trade-off, and we're going to use it to propose a number of experiments, and that will be mostly what I'll be talking about. Um, are there any questions so far? I don't know if I can just continue or we can wait till the end, but if there's any questions so far, um, I'm I happy to take them. I think you may continue. There are no questions thus far. So far, we don't. Okay. Have Do feel free to, to ask. Oh, there might be a question from Deepak. Deepak Ved, could you please unmute yourself and ask? Yeah. Uh, hi, Jonathan. I mean, hi, dear Yeah. Yeah. So not, not, not to be too controversial or anything. But uh, there would be a lot of people, uh, both from string theory and with quantum gravity and other branches of, uh, you know, who would disagree with your with your statement that we have not been able to quantize gravity. I mean, it's true that we don't have a complete consistent theory of quantum gravity. Uh, but uh, do you think it's it's reasonable to say that uh, there is no theory of quantum gravity? Yeah, I think it's definitely reasonable to say there's no quantum theory of gravity in 
you know, the loop quantum gravity approach, um, you know, there is a, a theory of spin foams, but there is no evidence that um, that the low energy limit is gravity at all. Um, so, you know, it's just a, it's a theory without time. We don't even recover time. So I would say loop quantum gravity has not shown that it's a theory of gravity um, um, and doesn't is not able to show that the low energy limit is a theory of gravity. Um, you know, string theory, uh, one could say various things about it, whether, you know, we, we don't see supersymmetry, uh, we don't see extra dimensions, although, you know, maybe they exist. Um, but I guess more importantly, I don't think there's any evidence that that's a consistent theory in the sense that it always uses a preferred background. And the one thing we know about general relativity is that it should be background independent. So I would say that there's, you know, we don't at the moment have um, any evidence that we will be able to quantize gravity. Um, um, I yeah, realize I, that I, this, I, this is a controversial, this may be a controversial statement because there's thousands of string theorists and they will disagree with me, but um, yeah. uh, okay, I mean, I could uh, argue with you on, on various uh, points, but I'll leave it at that. Deepak, let's, let's uh, take that later. Let's continue with the flow of the talk, please. Good, yeah. I'd be happy to discuss that at the mm -hmm. end. Um, so, okay, this is the, the, the um, I'm going to get now to the, uh, I think, the central point of the talk. It's going to be, I'm going to try and present it very simply. Um, so I hope to bring everybody with me. Um, on this point, um, because we're just going to talk about the double slit experiment. Um, and so hopefully, uh, hopefully we can um, uh, go through that very, very carefully, and I'm happy to take questions on this. So let's go, this is, um, in fact, Feynman's argument from the Chapel Hill conference. You can read the proceedings online. It's, uh, it makes for an interesting read. Um, I'm going to give a version of the experiment, which is mostly due to Yakir Aronov. Um, and the experiment as follows, it's a thought experiment. Um, we just do an interference experiment using massive particles, electrons, the moon, whatever. And we do a double slit experiment. So we fire a bunch of particles which have mass. We fire them through the slits and they, and as we know, as, as we've seen experimentally, they form an interference pattern. Um, and now um, these particles say electrons, they interact with the electromagnetic field and they produce an electromagnetic field but they also produce a gravitational field and the question is can the gravitational field they produce can it be classical in nature so let's imagine that it's classical in nature so the um the planet when or the electron when it's going through the right slit it produces a different gravitational field than when it's um on the left going through the left slit and so let's imagine, for example, it's going on the right, and so it's going along this path, um, and it will produce a gravitational field. And the point of, um, uh, you know, if the gravitational field that it produces is classical, then we can measure that gravitational field. We can measure it using a pendulum very close to the particle. We can measure the any gravitons that get emitted, or sorry, not gravitons, but any gravity waves which get emitted. Um, and um, because the field is classical, we can measure that field to arbitrary accuracy without disturbing anything. That's the um, not, that's the thing about uh, about classical fields. We can measure them to arbitrary accuracy without any disturbance. And so, because the gravitational field will be different depending on whether the particle goes through the right right slit or the left slit, we can measure the gravitational field classically to determine which slit the particle went through. And if we know which slit the particle went through, then we know that it could not have formed an interference pattern. So that essentially is Feynman and Yekir Aronov's um, argument about why we must quantize the gravitational field. And there's been various enhancements and versions of this argument um, since then. Okay. Um, other questions about that argument? Uh, I don't find any. Uh, I will request people to raise their hands, but you know, let's continue, please. Okay. I mean, don't be shy. There's always questions about this, um, usually. Um, so, okay. Deepan. Yes, sir. Am I am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, wouldn't the so wouldn't the swinging pendulum have something to do with the with the trajectory of the particle? 
coming to the slips? Well, the swinging pendulum is what I use to measure the gravitational field. So I use a swinging pendulum, and if it swings, you know, faster, closer to when it, when it's on the right side versus the other, I might have another swinging pendulum on the left side, and you know, I can use that swinging pendulum to measure the, the gravitational field. And the thing is about classical fields is that they don't, you can make the back reaction arbitrarily small. So I can perform this measurement with, and I can keep the back reaction and the disturbance to a minimum. On the other hand, if it was a quantum field, I wouldn't be able to do that. So that's the main difference between the classical field and the quantum okay. field. I can measure the classical field to arbitrary accuracy. Yes, yes, that was my question. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Okay. In fact, I can measure this field, you know, very far um, from the actual um, double slit experiment. I can sit all the way out here. That's why I've had this gravity wave detector, but I could just have another pendulum over here, which measures the gravitational field very far from um, the, this box. So, you know, there's nothing, I can, I can do this very far away and I can even measure, you know, it won't disturb the system at all. Um, now, it's worthwhile thinking about what happens with the electromagnetic field. If I have the electromagnetic field, then, you know, it does get entangled. You know, after it's hit the, the, the screen, for example, it will be entangled with the two different states of the electromagnetic field. The electromagnetic field will be left in a slightly different state, depending on whether the particle went through the left slit or the right slit. But the main difference um, in the quantum case is that you can have two different electromagnetic field states, the left field and the right field here, EL and ER, and they can be different, distinct, depending on whether the particle went through the left slit or the right slit. Nonetheless, they will have a very large overlap and they cannot be measured to determine which slit the particle went through. So we are all used to this. We have a you know some entanglement between the um, particle, the moon or the electron, and the states of the electromagnetic field that, that it leaves um, after the, it hits the screen. Um, nonetheless, there can still be, oops, large um, coherences here represented by alpha because the overlap of the left field versus the right field is very large. On the other hand, in the case of a classical field, we know that a classical field, if it's different, then there is no overlap. They can be um, you know, measured to arbitrary accuracy and they are different. So that's the difference between the classical case and the quantum case. Uh, um, and there's a, but there is a loophole. And the loophole is that um, Feynman and Yakir's argument um, crucially depends on the fact that the um, production of the gravity, the, the, the back reaction on the gravitational field is deterministic. In other words, when the particle is on the right, it produces a single gravitational, you know, a particular state of the gravitational field. When it's on the left, it produces a different state of the gravitational field. However, if the, if there's some stochasticity, if there's some randomness, if it produces the field probabilistically, then measuring the gravitational field will not unambiguously determine which slit the particle went through. So for example, here, I'm imagining that the particle goes, say, along the right slit. When it does that, it produces a probability distribution of different gravitational fields. I'm just representing them heuristically here, and they um, cannot always be distinguished. Um, um, you know, the left and the right field cannot always be distinguished. Um, now, if I wait long enough, and this particle moves, 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 and the box is very long, then, and there's a very long coherence time, then eventually I will be able to determine which slit um, the particle went through because eventually these two fields will become distinct enough. I'll collect enough data that I will be able to determine which slit the particle went through. Um, but until I've done that, I will not have determined which slit the particle went through and there can still be an interference pattern. Um, so what we are actually able to prove is that there's a general relation between the coherence time, in other words, how long this particle will travel before the interference pattern is made, between the, interfer the coherence time, tau, d, which is the diffusion, which is how wide these two different probability distributions are, and the force 
that the particle is exerting on the gravitational field, um, the back reaction. So there's this trade-off which happens um, depending, uh, which, which has to be um, satisfied if the field is to be classical. So this is like a quantification of Feynman and Aronoff's argument, which says, well, you can have a classical gravitational field, but it has to obey this trade-off relation. In other words, um, it can be classical, but it has to be stochastic. It has to be probabilistic. And there's D2, which measures how wide these peaks are. Here is how wide these peaks are. Um, that has to be very large if you have long coherence times. Um, and this is what we call the decoherence versus diffusion trade-off. Um, there's almost always questions at this point. So if there are any here, I, I'm happy to take them. Any questions? Uh, Jonathan, if you wouldn't mind uh, just uh, explaining. I, I mean, I, I didn't quite catch the drift of the argument. Um, so what, where is the diffusion coming from? Oh, I don't say where the diffusion comes from. I just um, say, if the gravitational field is, or if any, you know, uh, any field, but it doesn't have to be gravitational, this is a general rule which holds for all classical quantum dynamics. Um, whatever states that this particle produces, depending on whether it goes in the left slit or the, through the left slit or the right slit, there has to be um, um, some, uh, it, it has to be produced stochastically in order that you can't tell which slit the particle went through with certainty. Because if you could tell with certainty which slit the particle went through, then there would be no interference pattern. So if there's an interference pattern and the field is classical, what it must mean is that the two states of this classical field somehow cannot be distinguishable. And so they must be probability distributions of the states of this classical field and these probably probability distributions must have some overlap. Right. And so, this D2 measures how wide these two distributions are, and the wider they are, the larger the overlap. Okay, thanks. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, yeah. No, so, I, of course, I, I, the, the two things that makes these two different probability distributions, the left one and the right one, the thing that makes them have overlap and therefore allows for an interference pattern is both how wide they are and how far apart they are. So how far apart they are is the force, is the back reaction force, which pushes these two distributions apart. And the, the diffusion, this D2, is how stochastic they are, how, what, you know, how much noise there is in my system. So if the force is very strong, like electromagnetism is a very strong force, there would need to be a lot of diffusion there would be a need to be a lot of stochasticity and randomness in order that you don't know whether the particle went through the left slit or the right slit but because gravity is so weak this force here is very is very weak and so the amount of stochasticity that you need in order for there still to be an interference pattern doesn't need to be as much right okay so my bottom line is you're saying that even a classical force uh, which uh, has a stochastic nature can uh, exhibit interference patterns. Exactly. If the, um, the this particle can um, back react on a classical field, um, as long as it does so probabilistically with some noise, right. and the noise has to be large enough that measuring the classical field will not allow you to distinguish whether the particle went through the left slit or the right slit. Okay, thanks. Um, there's a question, I guess, from Samgeet. Samgeet, can you quickly ask your question? You know, we are kind of we would like to be on time as well. Yeah, Samgeet, yeah. please so, ask. Yeah, okay. can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so this uh, this gravitational field, uh, so when you said it is, uh, it could be stochastic, is it the gravitational field that's stochastic or the electromagnetic field? Like, I, I didn't quite catch that. It's the back reaction that needs to be stochastic. So the force that is uh, that this particle exerts on the gravitational field has to be stochastic. So it fluctuates. Okay. okay. So the, the the back reaction force 
of the quantum particle on the gravitational field would have to be probabilistic and stochastic. Okay, I understand. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I've got 15 minutes left. Um, we had a lot of questions, which is great because I this is the main point of the talk. I think if you can understand this thought experiment, then you've understood the main point. Um, um, and so now what we're proposing- too much of your time, but uh, you know, since you're uh, inviting questions, yes, uh, please. I mean, there is the whole, whole uh, view that uh, quantum mechanics can be understood as a diffusion, as a theory of diffusion, mm -hmm. right? I mean, one can, one can show that I think fairly rigorously uh, that there is a mapping between a pair of diffusion equation and the Schrodinger equations. That's right. So, so, so if one adopts that view, uh, then um, that doesn't that sort of like uh, answer the questions that you are asking? Um, about gravity. I mean, there is there, there is a relation in the sense that so you're right that the Schrodinger equation in a certain light looks like a what you know what's called the Fokker Planck equation, um, and so there is of course some relationship, but it's it's um, I, you know I I'm not claiming that quantum theory is has a classical nature because of course we have Bell's theorem, which shows that it, it doesn't, at least if it's a local theory. So I certainly am not claiming that quantum theory has a classical nature behind it. I'm just saying that, uh, so the key part about quantum theory actually is that you can have different states, which nonetheless have overlap. Um, that's the main thing. And I'm saying that that is also true of classical probability distributions. Okay, thanks. So there is, yeah, there is an analogy between quantum theory and classical theory. We shouldn't, you know, treat it necessarily completely seriously, but in terms of these thought experiments here, we see that they do hold some sway, but in some other experiments, like the Bell experiment, they wouldn't. Good. So what are we proposing? We are proposing that um, uh, we want to, uh, we have this trade-off between how much coherence, the coherence time, tau, and how much diffusion there is in a uh, noise in a gravitational field. And so what we're proposing is that we go and we look for this, um, we measure coherence times using say gold atoms, which are the, which are very dense and therefore give us the best bounds. And we go and we look at Cavendish type experiments, high precision Cavendish experiments where people measure one, kilo, you know, a, a one kilogram mass and we, uh, there's already a, a lot of noise in these experiments, so it's hard to reduce this noise, but we propose that we try and reduce this noise as much as possible in order to place a bound on how much diffusion there could be in the gravitational field. And in, by, you know, if we're able to violate this trade-off relation that we have um, derived, then we would be able to show that gravity um, cannot have a classical nature. It must be either quantum or something beyond quantum theory. So these are the proposal to test for the quantum nature of gravity I, I by going that. around and doing double slit experiments and Cavendish experiments. Yes? Okay, so so actually you are saying that uh, this, uh, this interaction, I mean, the force exerted by the electromagnetic uh, field to the uh, gravi uh, gravitational field is stochastic. So, uh, so the, uh, uh, how do you think the uh, like uh, this probability distribution is quantum in nature or classical? Like it has a classical explanation. Yeah. So so the, so the if I were to measure the Newtonian potential of a one kilogram mass, yes. I would find that it fluctuates. It's not one particular value. It's fluctuating all the time. And so, you know, when, when we do a Cavendish experiment, I don't know if you've ever, you know, usually one does that often in a undergraduate physics class, one can do this. And if you've ever looked, done it, it moves around quite a bit because you have this torsion pendulum and it's being hit by molecules and uh, everything. So, it's, so it is moving a lot. So there is a lot of stochasticity already in this experiment. But what we're proposing is that if, well, we're not, we, we, what we've derived is that if the gravitational field is classical, there is some genuine stochasticity which can never be removed, no matter how good a vacuum you have, um, no matter how low temperature you do it, you will always have 
some noise in the gravitational field and the Newtonian potential, which you can look for. Okay, okay. Thank you. Good. So, um, you know, there are these experiments being um, being done, and we've derived various figures of merit, which can be used to probe the quantum nature of gra uh, gravity. Um, we are uh, we find that we can already rule out some very simple models of classical gravity. Um, so we can rule some out, um, and the idea would be to perform these experiments to higher precision in order to squeeze, in some sense, any theory in which gravity is classical from both sides. So you, you, you find longer and longer coherence times and put an upper bound on the diffusion and you in fact squeeze um, any theory where gravity is classical, you want to try and squeeze it out um, in order to either show that the gravitational field has a quantum nature or you know, get the opposite conclusion. Um, and so these are in some sense, maybe um, experiments which are um, which can be done now. Um, there's also these gravitational entanglement experiments by BMV, um, Bose et al., um, and some new experiments which have come online by um, Martin Plenio and Ludovico Lamy, et cetera, um, and Dan Carney. And so various people are now proposing experiments of a different nature to measure um, the quantum nature of gravity. So this is an exciting time where, you know, we, I think, will soon, uh, we, we, where we can already do these experiments and in uh, maybe in the future, we'll be able to perform these additional experiments, which actually you know look for quantum effects in gravity like entanglement. Um, okay, so I don't have much time left. Um, I'm not going to then talk about the semi-classical Einstein equation. It's what's usually used um, in discussions of gravity. Um, um, uh, you know, when you want to treat uh, gravity classical in what's called the semi-classical limit. Um, uh, it's pathological because it relies on expectation value, so it's nonlinear. I won't go into the argument um, here. I'll just skip it because we we're running out of time. But I will show you the general form of the dynamics. Um, and uh, let me show it actually here. Um, so, you know, you can imagine an experiment where you have a planet on the left or a planet on the right, or you can put it in superposition. And you can ask, you know, what happens um, to a test mass, which I drop when the particle is in superposition. Um, and we find that it's governed by um, the following master equation. So if you're used to open quantum systems, you will be used to such, um, I have a simple form for it. Um, no, unfortunately. So um, if, you know, if, you, if you've done um, um, open quantum systems, you, or Fokker-Planck equation, you will be used to um, such master equations. So I have um, what is in some sense a um, density matrix over phase space combined with a, um, uh, a sorry, a, a phase space density over phase space and a matrix over um, the, the Hilbert space. Um, and I can, describe its evolution by um, a combination of things that look like a Fokker-Planck equation and look like a um, um, look like a Lindblad equation. So here we have just the deterministic evolution, classical evolution, this is the Louisville equation given by the Poisson bracket of the gravity Hamiltonian. We have the um, commutator, which is the Heisenberg, the quantum evolution, the deterministic quantum evolution, given by the matter Hamiltonian here with our density matrix. And then we have this back reaction term. And it looks like the, you know, the back reaction is the Poisson bracket of the gravitational degrees of freedom, but with an operator ordering which uh, uh, is on the left and the right. So this is sometimes called uh, the Garimisov bracket, the Alexandrov Garimisov bracket. And then we just have this thing which looks, uh, there has to be, as I mentioned, we've talked about decoherence and diffusion. There's this decoherence term, which just looks like a Lindblad equation, a Lindblad term. And there's this diffusion equation, which looks like a Fokker Planck term. It's like a double uh, commutator for the Lindblad part and a double Poisson bracket 
for the Fokker Planck part, they have a very similar form. And you need both these terms. This is this decoherence versus diffusion trade-off in order to have this back reaction term over here. So this is what the master equation looks like. And if you understand open quantum systems, you will understand this equation with a bit of work. Okay, so um, I guess I've got a um, maybe a little bit more time to maybe 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes to go into the formalism a little bit. I'll do that here. We have, recall we in quantum mechanics, we have the Heisenberg equation for the evolution of the density matrix sigma. In classical mechanics, we have the Louisville equation for the evolution of the phase space density rho. And we want to combine these two things, phase space, a point in phase space with a ray in the Hilbert space. And we can do that um, by considering a, um, a probability density over the phase space. So there's a probability density rho, um, that a probability that the particle is at the point Q and P in phase space. And now, given that it is at the, this is just a conditional probability distribution, given that the particle is at a point Q and P in phase space, there is a density matrix which describes it. So probability of being in the zero state for a qubit probability of being in the one state, if it's a qubit, and the coherence, given that it's at a point Q and P in phase space. So the formalism is, you know, a, a, I like um, showing these slides because you can see that the formalism for classical dynamics, quantum dynamics, and this com combined CQ dynamics looks very similar. In quantum mechanics, we have a positive matrix, which has unit trace that's how we describe the density matrix of a quantum system in classical mechanics we have a phase space density which is a positive and integrates to one positive distribution and so in combined classical quantum dynamics at each point in phase space you have a density matrix and it is normalized in the sense that when you take the trace and you integrate over phase space it equals one so that's the normalization it's positive and we can describe it in another way, a number of ways. So some of you might be used to describing it in a purely quantum formalism. We call this a CQ state. In other words, as a projector onto a point Z in phase space, Z here is Q and P. And given that it's at a particular point Z, it has a density matrix sigma. So that's the um, state space of combined classical quantum dynamics. And now you just do what we always do when we talk about, for example, Lindblad equations or the Fokker Planck equation. You ask what's the most um, general, completely positive trace preserving map, um, which you know pre um, preserves this, the form of the state space, this division of classical and quantum. Um, and we find that this is the master equation um, that we get, okay? And it's linear, trace preserving, um, and completely positive. Um, one can also have a path integral formulation of it. Um, I won't get into that. Um, and um, we find something, I guess, quite remarkable. I in, well, something at least that's, that surprised me, which is that when we saturate this trade off that I've been talking about, what we find is that even though there's all this stochasticity and noise in the system, the quantum state stays pure conditioned on the classical trajectory. So if we have a superposition of a, um, a moon on the left and the right, then that superposition eventually um, evolves to either being on the left or the right, um, and it does it stochastic, stochastically, um, but it stays pure conditioned on the trajectory of the classical field. And this is what general relativity looks like. Um, and we are at the 45 minute mark, so I will just now end um, with reviewing uh, what I've just said quickly and talking about the challenges. Um, so the main challenges I would say is um, regularization to show that the theory is renormalizable and regularizable. Um, 
um, you know, that uh, we, that is the main thing we are trying to show now um, and looking at things like, does it have anomalous heating and things like that. Um, in terms of reviewing what we've found so far, um, I guess the question I've posed is, is the space-time metric somehow classical? Um, I have no idea. There are, I think, reasons why we might imagine that gravity is special. Um, and the, the main message I think that I tried to convey here is that gravity could be classical. There are, um, you know, consistent theories in which it is classical. I've been given in a bet one to 5,000 odds, which I will gladly take because I think it's, you know, very unclear in my view whether gravity is fundamentally quantum or not. If the space-time metric is fundamentally classical, we get a number of bonuses. So we find that information can be lost in black holes, but the quantum state remains pure. So quantum information is not lost, but we have a breakdown of predictability, which in my view is consistent with um, what we see, for example, in um, information loss or something called the... Um, um, Oop, I've lost my uh, words, but uh, um, the AMS paradox, sorry. So we see in something called the AMS paradox, it, it kind of pushes us towards the idea that information is probably lost in black holes. Um, um, and so this gives a, would give an explanation for information loss. It gives a explanation for the, um, for the Born rule and the measurement postulate um, is not needed. Um, and it is something which is experimentally testable, which for me is one of the most um, exciting things. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jonathan. That was indeed a very pedagogical and a very insightful talk, I believe, though, you know, I'm not really a specialist in the field, but I can see that, you know, it's a very nice lecture that you put together. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, there are questions. I think some some Geet had a question, and I asked her to like temporarily put her hand down. So we'll start with some Geet. Please ask your question. Okay. So can you hear me? I can. Okay. So this might be a trivial doubt, but uh, uh, going back to the decoherence versus diffusion trade-off, you mentioned that uh, you know the back reaction being stochastic uh, would make the uh, uh, would it, would make it possible for the gravitational field to be classical right that's right okay so uh, does this uh, stochasticity like, could this stochasticity come from the uh, probabilistic nature of uh, the quantum particles or uh, you know could there be some uh, stochastic nature in the gravitational field itself or right so, uh, so i mean i guess you know, sometimes people think of quantum states as being probabilistic in the sense that if you perform a measurement you will have a you know probabilistic outcomes but in this theory or you know if you think about in in a theory of quantum mechanics without measurement there is no stochasticity um, there's no problem, you know, uh, the, the quantum state is in a definite and pure quantum state initially, and it if the evolution is unitary, it remains in a pure state, and so there's no, um, you know, the, the, the quantum state is in a definite state. There is an uncertainty if I perform certain measurements, but the quantum state, there's no real uncertainty in the quantum state itself. We know what the quantum state is. If we knew what it was at time t equals zero, we know what it was at every other time, exactly. Um, so unitary evolution of quantum states mean there's no actual stochasticity in the quantum theory. So all the stochasticity here is coming from the coupling, the back reaction between the quantum state and the classical field. But does that answer the question? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, we have a question from Usha Devi. Usha, could you please ask yes. a question? Yes, please. Uh, very interesting talk. Thank you for that. I wanted to ask you what uh, take, what uh, can you comment on mathematicians' take on this uh, quantocastic dynamics, where they start with a pure state of uh, 
system and an environment and you have the kind of quantum eto formula to generalize that is you have a stochastic nature there so that uh, uh, do you have any comment on that in line with your uh, talk um i think so if if i understand what you're saying you, you were talking about like a lindblad or yes. eto formalism where i have an environment and i trace out the environment is that is that right, right? yeah so right. um that is a theory um where there's some there's there is some analogy between the lindblad equation and these um classical quantum equations um but in fact um we believe although we don't have a proof that it would be impossible to purify this theory in other words um i do not believe that you can get this theory by tracing out an environment okay. and the reason uh, is that all right so what i would say is there is lindblad equation is not guaranteed in a quantum stochastic process always that's lindblad true lindblad comes only under markov uh, approximation indeed, but in indeed. general there is a nonlinear stochastic uh, schrodinger equation where yes. you have uh, some uh, quantum <laughs> environmental uh, dynamics which would lead to stochasticity and also the measurement trajectories which uh, would give Indeed. so so here i make we're making the assumption because here we're we're um interested in or at least one of the motivations is an interest in whether gravity could be fundamentally classical then we are um, assuming um that the theory is markovian um if on the other hand this was a purely effective theory in other words if fundamentally um gravity is quantum and the classical limit is only effective then um i think you're right then the the markovian limit is some invalid is would be valid some of the time but wouldn't always be valid and then we would um want a theory in which we somehow don't make such a strong assumption as markovianity okay thank you okay uh, we will take a question from gurpahal singh gurpahal can you please ask uh yes hi sir uh, very interesting talk and uh, yeah so i uh, wanted to ask that uh, what is the like the time scale uh, during uh, you know your pure state when you start from pure state in that decurrence and diffusion trade off you said that it remains pure so like what is the time scale that happens during which it you know goes to the top of the block sphere or bottom of the block sphere and also uh, you know uh, is it uh, something that you are claiming to be what happens during a measurement process and if that's so uh, what is special uh, you know special when a measurement happens that you know we reach this saturation limit and we get that result uh, um yeah. yeah so i so i guess um i guess we would view uh, here you just assume that you have um some fundamentally classical field so here we're assuming gravity or you know the space time metric is classical and then you get this collapse in some sense um and so when we're performing a measurement we of course end up producing two very different states of the gravitational field and so that would be the cause of the collapse you Im could imagine for example you have a cascade effect of you know your particle hits some um uh photomultiplier tube and that produces more photons and then those two different states are very different and uh, gravitationally and um um cause the quantum system to become classical so that's how one might view a measurement it, you might also think of this theory as oh well let's just imagine that the observer we treat fundamentally classical and then we would also find such an effect so i guess this is a this is a, um my view is that rather than talk about measurement we can just talk about a system we treat classically and a quantum system and then we see that we get the born rule and um the measurement postulate for free in terms of the time scales um you know i guess it's the, the theory doesn't predict um uh so 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 the uh, if we take the most naive the, the theories uh, which have been proposed we find that already the coherence time uh, which i believe is 10 to the minus 10 seconds of say uh, a gold atom that already uh, is 
too long a coherence time for this theory. So the coherence time needs to be shorter for these, uh, what we call ultra local non relativistic theories. Um, so you, uh, but for other, th other theories, you can have longer coherence times. I'm not sure if that answers the question. No, yeah, yeah so it does. Thank you. Yeah. I've, I've posted the numbers here. I'm not sure how helpful they are, <laughs> but they're in the uh, various, in the decoherence versus diffusion. Very interesting. Very nicely explained. Uh, we'll take one more question from Deepan, Deepan Bethel. Yes, I'm audible. Yes. Is, is there is there any experiment similar to the Arno bomb effect which can which can determine if this if the stochasticity is is there because of quantum or classical reasons? I mean, if it's if, if the gravity is classical quantum through some Arno bomb kind of effect for for uh, massive particles interfering. Yeah, so there's a, there's this thing called the aronoff kescher effect, um, which is the analog of the aronoff bohm effect for the gravitational field. Um, and that assumes of, that the gravitational field is quantum. Um, so I suppose uh, that that would give a, you know, a negative answer. Um, in other words, if you, you that, 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 that may be a, um, a way in which one could measure whether the gravitational field is fundamentally quantum or not by looking for the aronoff kescher effect. Um, I'm not aware of how feasible that is in comparison to, say, the, uh, the um, entanglement experiments. I think that's a very good question. And maybe, uh, you know, this provides additional motivation to look at how feasible that experiment would be. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? Questions or perspectives, please feel free to raise your hand or, you know, you, we still have a few minutes, so you might. Okay, Lava Kumar, yeah. can you kindly ask your question? Sorry, somebody's so, asking. So, uh, so the stochastic nature in this uh, gravitational fields is coming due to like, uh, Due to what? I mean, due to the potential. Um, I mean, why there is a stochastic nature you are seeing in the gravitation? Well, I, I guess we just, um, you know, you can just derive, uh, we just show that it has to be, have a stochastic nature if it is to be classical. Um, and then we derive what the equation has to look like. Um, in terms of, you know, an explanation for this, uh, uh, I don't have, you know, I don't have one. It may be that, you know, one could imagine that there is some environment which is producing such a thing, but I, d I don't see any, uh, I guess that is not something that uh, uh, I've, I've been able to think about too much. So uh, all we can say at the moment is this is the form of the equation. This is what you get. If you just, you know, let's just make the assumption that gravity is classical and see where that leads us. And we get that it has to obey the stochastic equation. Um, I don't have any explanation as to why that might be the case. Okay. Uh, Jonathan, I actually had a question, though I'm a complete non-expert in this domain. Um, I'm a biophysicist and mm -hmm. we look, look, you know, we use classical uh, dynamics to look at um, you know, how biology behaves at the molecular mm -hmm. scale, but still I'll try to ask a question, which is, you know, we uh, frequently have to deal with the fluctuation dissipation theorem, where, you know, you have, uh, you know, you have a systematic equilibrium and, you know, if there's a small perturbation, we can actually monitor the rate of decay and, you know, extract useful information about the system. Um, so it's kind of a response theory formalism. I was mm -hmm. wondering, you know, since you're talking of stochasticity and gravity, I was wondering if there's something analogous or, you know, if we could take that intuition, uh, many scales, many orders of magnitude downwards and work with that. I don't know if this question is even relevant. I, I think it's a good question. Um, and I don't know the answer to it. So, um, you know, here... Uh, we're we're not um, we're not looking at a I mean it is in some sense that there has to be a stochasticity in response to the back reaction force but it's not um, I don't think it's a, a similar kind of form to 
uh, fluctuation dissipation theorem, um, whether one could derive some equation like that. I'm something that I, you know, has struck me before, but not something that I uh, have, have pursued. So I think it's an interesting question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a last question from Deepak before we move on to the next talk. So Deepak. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Chitanjali. Uh, um, I, sorry, Nilanjala, my, my mistake. Um, it's it's not, not a question, just a comment um, about the, the fact that uh, it's incorrect to say that loop quantum gravity does not have a continuum limit. Uh, you, you can show, and it has been shown for a long time, that you can calculate the graviton propagator from spin forms and you get uh, exactly the form that is expected in uh, from semi-classical GR. And there's also a formulation of loop quantum gravity known as group field theory. And in that one can rigorously show that you get cosmological space times uh, as emergent condensates. So I just, I just want to put that out there <laughs> that uh, you know, we, do have, we do have correspondence between classical physics and quantum gravity in this picture. I mean, my, my, my understanding of, um, and it's secondhand, so it comes from, you know, review articles by, say, Rovelli, et cetera, is that indeed you, you're correct that there is, can be a correspondence sometimes in, a, in what is a solution. So you might say, oh, we have a solution of, in this thing, which we can say maybe looks like a cosmological solution. That's not the same thing as saying that you can derive, that, that you get Einstein's equations as the semi-classical limit. And that's, you know, so there's no, um, there's no indication that I'm aware or that, or, or certainly no firm result, which shows that you get Einstein's equation as the, in the low energy limit. Um, that you can maybe get an analog between one solution and another solution, that, that, that there may be in some cases, but I don't think that necessarily takes you very far. Um, no, I, I, I see the point that you're making and, and, and I agree. Uh, yeah, that's something to think about. Okay, so thank you very much. It was a series of very interesting discussions and thank you, Jonathan, for a very interesting talk and you know delivered with you know so much more so much insight so thank you uh, very much and thanks to the audience for being you know for asking excellent questions and for this excellent participation and let me yeah.